So as Anne was saying, our scripture reading today is uh, the story, the famous story of uh, Jacob uh, wrestling with God. And you can find that, uh, we're going to read it together, you can find that in Genesis chapter 32, and it's verses 22 through to verse 32. And this comes at the end of kind of if almost, if you like, the first half of uh, Jacob's life where he's made a mess of things with his brother Esau and he's fled uh, to be with his uncle uh, and things don't go particularly well there. We'll, we'll touch on that in the, the sermon shortly. Uh, so he has to flee now from his uncle back towards his brother uh, whom he has uh, not unreasonably is thinking that his brother is out to get him as well. And so we find him at, at this uh, pivotal moment, uh, and this is what happens. So Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through to 32. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants, and his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions. So Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched eh, as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? And then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Amen. So I don't know what you uh, think about when you think about Jacob. Uh, maybe you think of him as uh, a great hero of the faith. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the three great patriarchs of Israel. Jacob, or Israel, as he's renamed here, which literally means he wrestled with God. Jacob, whose 12 sons give their names to the 12 tribes of Israel. Maybe you love the musical, Joseph and his technicolored dream coat, way, way back many centuries ago, not long after the Bible began. Jacob lived in the land of Canaan, yeah, a fine example of a family man. Well, that's questionable, yeah, as we'll see. Jacob, Jacob and sons. But the reality is that here in uh, Genesis 32, uh, Jacob is not quite so heroic. In fact, uh, as we encounter him here, he's a shell of a man. If we quickly recap his uh, story, he took advantage of his uh, older brother, Esau, only just older. They were twins, but Esau was the older brother. He took advantage of his brother's hunger uh, to do him out of his birthright, which included the inheritance rights of the firstborn son. Then he deceived his father Isaac when Isaac's sight was almost gone into giving him the blessing that rightly belonged to Esau. And then Jacob runs for his life as Esau is understandably fuming. Then he gets himself cheated out of 
uh, the wife that he desires, Rachel, after working seven years for his uncle Laban for her hand in marriage, he's given her sister Leah instead. So he works another seven years for his uncle to secure Rachel as his second wife. And then he dupes his uncle out of a whole host of sheep and goats, securing the strong ones for himself and leaving the weak ones for his uncle. So now Jacob has to flee from his uncle in Paddan Aram because Laban, his uncle, is now mad at him too. And that's where we find him today. His uncle is after him looking for revenge. And he knows here that Esau, who he has done serious wrong to in the past, is coming to meet him and for all that he knows is thirsty for his blood. So notice what he does. He sends his wife and his, his wives, I should say, and his servant women and his children over the river before him, almost as if he's creating a buffer between himself and his brother Esau. And you have to question the kind of man who gets so scared that he would send women and children to be the first line of defense against an impending foe. But that's what he does. And by doing that, by sending the women and children on ahead of him, he finds himself all alone. Verse 24, Jacob was left alone. He's a coward. He's a cheat. He's a thief. He's a schemer. He's a stubborn deceiver. He's a shell of a man. And there's no mother here to fight his corner. There's no possessions here to hide behind. There's no situation here to take advantage of. He's all alone. And he's completely vulnerable. But it's in his vulnerability that God comes to do his work in Jacob's life. A man who will, he, he will later recognize to be God himself came and wrestled with him till daybreak. And it's in our vulnerability, I think, that God often does his best work in our lives. We live in a world that values independence, the ability to stand on our own two feet. Our culture teaches us to be strong and powerful and self-sufficient people. It does not teach us to be, and it does not value vulnerability. And like Jacob so often did, we hide behind all of our stuff, all our possessions, our bank balances, our accomplishments, our respectability, but scratch beneath the surface only a little bit and the reality becomes plain to see that we are weak, that we're limited, that we're mortal, we're vulnerable. And it doesn't take much for it to hit us. A sudden illness or a baby that's born that doesn't survive or redundancy and the list could go on and on and on. But when we admit to our vulnerability, God begins to do his work in us in ways that he does not do when we keep our defenses up. You see, God will never force us. After all, surely God could have overpowered Jacob, but he limits himself here to the extent that he cannot Verse 25, he couldn't overpower him. And Jacob stubbornly wrestles on, even in his weakness and isolation. And actually, it's only when the man asks his name, which if this is God, he surely already knew his name. It's only when the man asks his name that Jacob's real vulnerability shows through. I'm Jacob, he answered. Now, Jacob, even the name Jacob, which literally means he holds the heel, because when 
uh, the twins were born, Esau came out first, and Jacob, the second twin, came out holding on to Esau's heel. It literally means he holds the heel. It speaks of who he is because he holds the heel became a Hebrew byword for a deceiver. His very name, Jacob, became proverbial for the unsavory quality of deceptiveness. And God wants to know here. He wants to know if he'll own up to his name. And as he does so, everything is laid bare. I'm Jacob, the liar, the cheat, the schemer, the deceiver. Here I am. What is your name? Now, it doesn't seem particularly strange that in response to the question, he answers, I'm Jacob, but for the fact that the last time Jacob had been asked to reveal his identity was back in Genesis chapter 27, verses 18 and 19, when he and his, he and his mother had schemed together to steal Esau's blessing, Jacob going in to see his aging father wrapped in a goatskin disguise. And Isaac asked him, for he could not see him, who are you? And he said, I am your son, your firstborn son, Esau. I think the thing is, of course, that we all have a penchant for wearing disguises, whether we like to admit it or not. Just as Jacob went in to see his father disguised as his brother Esau, we all like to wear disguises, whether we like to admit it or not. The French painter Rouault, it happened upon a circus caravan. And he witnessed an old clown sitting there, darning his glittered costume. And what struck Rouault, and initiated a long series of paintings actually, was the contrast between the costume and the makeup worn by the clown and the infinite sadness that rested just below the paint and the glitter. I have clearly seen, he wrote, that the clown was I, was us, almost all of us. That sumptuous sequin covered costume is given to us by life. We're all clowns to a greater or lesser extent. We all wear a sequin covered costume. But if someone surprises us as I have surprised this, surprised this old clown, oh, who would then dare to say, that he's not been overwhelmed down to the pit of his stomach by an immense pity. Our lies might not be quite so blatant as Jacob's lies, but our disguises are often just as effective. But when all the things we hide behind are stripped away, when your past starts catching up with you, when your situation seems hopeless, it's in those times more often than not, that God meets us. When we're in the pit, as the psalmist says, Psalm 130, from the depths I cry to thee, O Lord. Or here, like Jacob, all alone in the darkness of the night. And when you come face to face with God, locked in hand-to-hand -hand combat, there is no hiding place. There are no effective disguises when in the depth of the night, all alone and vulnerable, we come face to face with God. Here, Jacob is fully known for who he is. He's laid himself bare, stripped off his defenses, exposed before his maker. And in the terror of that vulnerability, he can only trust that God will love him and not level him. And true enough, with his disguise, he's finally taken off. He gets the blessing that belongs to him. Not the blessing he stole from his brother, the blessing that belongs to him. Jacob's blessing that he receives when he finally takes off his disguise and faces up to who he is and who he's been. And then for the first time in his life, he prevails. He overcomes. 
God says to him, verse 28, you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. You've overcome. Jacob has never overcome in his life before. He's never seen anything through to the conclusion. He's always given up and run away when the going got tough. He'd run away from his home when it got heated with Esau. He ran away from his uncle Laban when his deception got found out. He cowers at the thought of meeting his brother, sending his wives and his children across and as a buffer between him and his brother instead of standing up for himself and all the mistakes that he's made. His is a story of half-truths and blatant lies, of schemes and deception, of cheating and stealing. It's not a story of prevailing and overcoming. He'd never seen anything through to its conclusion before. But now, all alone with God, completely vulnerable, wrestling in the dirt, he sticks with it. He sees it through. He prevails. He overcomes. You see, before, whenever the going had got tough for Jacob, he'd run from it. And you'd think here that the automatic response for Jacob would be to let go and run the moment that his hip was wrenched from his socket. Just to break down in pain and say, enough is enough. That would be the point you'd think that Jacob would give up. But Jacob had had enough of running away. And he held on to God for dear life. In his pain, he held on to God. And so for the first time in his life, he saw this through. Our default response when things are hard, I think, is to give up and run away, just like Jacob had done all his life. But here, even in the agony and the exhaustion and the fear of what the future might hold, Jacob held on and he saw it through. I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so if you feel like giving up, if you feel like turning your back on something, whatever it might be, if you feel like running away even, don't do it. Stick with it, even if it's painful. Even if it's hard, even if you're struggling to see where God is in all of it, don't give up the biblical reality, not the reality that our culture tries to sell us every single day. The biblical reality is that it's right there in the midst of the vulnerability and the hardship, in the dirt. That's where God comes to meet us. That God comes to meet us. That's grace. We don't go looking for him. Jacob hadn't gone out there looking for a fight. God comes to meet him. God comes to meet us. And even if we don't recognize him at first, as Jacob didn't recognize him, we hold on to him all the same. He comes and he gets into the dust and into the mud and he wrestles with us in our vulnerability and our pain. And in holding on to him, we prevail. We overcome. Jacob kept holding on. He's been wrestling all night, the text tells us, all night, but he's going to see this through until it's done. This time he's not running away when the going gets tough. He's going to see it through until he gets the blessing. And it's painful and it's hard, but he sees it through and he gets blessed. God rewards his persistence and he'll reward our persistence too. And finally, if we face up to our vulnerability, if we take off our disguises, if we stick with it until we overcome, you do need to know that you'll get scars. But every scar tells a story. So I have a scar 
right here on my forehead that I got when I was five years old. I was so excited to go and see the singing kettle in Princes Street Gardens that I was jumping up and down on my sofa uh, to the point where the sofa fell over. I hit my head on the radiator and had to go to the doctor to get stitches and missed the whole first half of the concert. But you see that every scar tells a story. As Dana Jennings, uh, he's a um, journalist for the New York Times, he wrote in his uh, weekly column about living with prostate cancer, our scars tell stories. Sometimes they're stark tales of life-threatening catastrophes, but more often they're just footnotes to the ordinary and bloody detours that befall us on the roadways of life. Any mother can tell you of how her body changed and was scarred by the process of pregnancy and childbirth. Think stretch marks, or if a C-section was involved, there's a scar all of its own. And these marks and scars tell the story of pain and worry, of difficult decisions and anxious hours, but they also tell the story of future promise and newfound joy. Any cancer survivor can tell you of the pain of that disease, the worry in themselves and those around them, and they can testify to the pain on the, of the surgeon's scalpel as the tumor is removed, but they can point to the scar that speaks of healing and hope. The scars on Jesus resurrected body were inflicted by a crown of thorns and a brutal scourging and by Roman nails. And I've often wondered, why did Jesus' resurrected body still bear the scars of the cross? But it's because those scars tell the story of our forgiveness and our redemption and our freedom and our victory in him. And Jacob leaves this encounter scarred, his hip is dislocated and he walks with a limp for the rest of his days. But that scar tells the story at one and the same time of a life of shame and deceit, but of God's favor and God's blessing nonetheless. His limp tells the story that though ever the schemer, seeking by any means to gain advantage over others, still by God's appointment and care, not by his own wits, he came into blessing. A painful blessing without question. But the reality is that only, only the blessings that are really, the only blessings that are really worth it are the painful, traumatic ones that scar us for life. Rarely physically, but definitely spiritually. And it's by those scars that people see that our lives are real and that our God is real and that he is a God who saves. Because believe me, that's not how people see Christians. They don't see us as weak and vulnerable and scarred people who are utterly dependent upon God. They see us as holier than thou and pious and good and proper and they don't think they could ever be one of us because they're not like that. But if we let the world see us as we really are, with all our scars, with all our weaknesses, with all our imperfections, people might start to think, you know, I could be a Christian too. But anyway, as I say, the only blessings that really matter in the economy of the kingdom of God are the ones which hurt and scar us and so give us a story to tell because every scar tells a story. Jesus said it. And by the way, isn't it interesting that the blessings we so often count look nothing like the list of blessings that Jesus gives in Matthew 5. Jesus said it, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kind of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, Jesus says. Because great is your reward in heaven. Matthew chapter 5 verses 10 to 12. That hurts. And that scars us. But those scars tell the story of a God who is worth the suffering. And make no mistake, it is a blessing. I was talking uh, to a mother a few 
uh, to, uh, to a, w a woman actually uh, a few years ago. This was about her mum, her mum who uh, suffered with mental illness for a number of years and who will be scarred by that for the rest of her life. In a sense, she'll walk with a limp. But that in holding on to God through it all has experienced the blessing to be greater than the pain as God has used those painful times to repair relationships with her children in ways she could never have imagined. A painful blessing, yes, but absolutely a blessing. And scars that tell a story of a God who is faithful and who cares deeply about broken relationships and who will go out of his way to restore what has fallen apart. And I can testify to it as well. I can testify to a God who meets us in the heart of the darkness and takes up our pain and picks us up and opens the future to us once again and walks with us every step of the journey. And I always knew that in my head. I always knew that in my head, but I only ever received it as a blessing when we lost our daughter and we were plunged into the darkness and into the pain for ourselves. And it hurt and I would never want anyone else to suffer it. But therein, in that vulnerability, with nowhere to run, as I held on to God because there was no one else to hold on to, I received a blessing that hurt like mad, but a blessing nonetheless. And I thank God for it. It bears the scar. I bear the scars to this day, and those scars will never heal. But it, they tell a story worth shouting of the, from the rooftops of a God who never leaves us, of a God who never walks out on us, of a God who never gives up on us. And I know it because I have the scars to prove it. Jacob's was a painful blessing which left him with the scar. But that scar has a story to tell of a God who met him in the dirt, in the mess and the shame of his life, but who loved him and cared for him and rescued him all the same. And that's a story worth telling. The last time that Jacob had been blessed with Esau's blessing, remember, Jacob fled into the night. The sun had set, darkness was falling. Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 to 11. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran and he came to a certain place and stayed there that night. But here on his journey back home, because that's where he's going, as he's wrestled in the mud and held on for the blessing that was rightfully his, the sun is coming up. It is daybreak, verse 31 the sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. So let down your defenses. Hold on for the blessing. See it through to the end. And let your scars tell the story that weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. Let's pray together. Father God, we confess that just like Jacob, our lives are often messy and we often put on disguises to try and hide from the truth of our existence. Help us to let down our defenses. To remove our disguises. To be vulnerable before you, Father God. And in that vulnerability, we pray that you would do your work in our lives. Your work of healing and of restoration. Of forgiveness of shaping us to be more like Jesus. And we know that that will hurt and that that will scar us. But we know that you're good. 
and that the scars in our life tell a story of your goodness and love. Thank you that you're a God who never gives up on us. You never gave up on Jacob and you never give up on us. You never walk out on us. You never leave us alone. You love us and you care for us. And we thank you and worship you for that. We give you glory for your goodness and your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen.